right. There we go. What do you think, Paul the Skull? Looks good, I guess, but you look like the Macho Man. Uh-huh. Getting everything ready for the 4th of July. Uh-huh. Everything's got to be just right. Dig it! Oh, I don't know why I even talk to you. Uh. Oh, ahoy there, mates. I'm just getting the old VHS pirate ship ready for my 4th of July extravaganza. It's going to be stars and stripes all day long. Don't you think it's all a bit much, even for you? A bit much? This is America, where a bit much is never enough. Yes, but aren't we in international waters? Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm still celebrating the birth of the good old U.S. of A. Oh, so you're celebrating abroad? <laughs> I celebrate lots of broads. Ayo! Oh, for fuck's sakes. Well, maybe the hat is a bit much. And the glasses. And the glasses. Now... Where is Little Creep? Greetings! Hey, Little Creep, you made it! Sure, I wouldn't miss your 4th of July party for the world! Thanks, buddy. Say, you sure do look festive. Of course, I just love the 4th of July. You do? Well, I never would have guessed. Hey, I may be an interdimensional spooky mystical being, but I'm not a commie! <laughs> yeah, you know, folks, 4th of July is a very special time of year. Fireworks, cookouts... Ooh, don't, don't forget, forget potato, potato salad! salad. Yes, potato salad. And it's all to celebrate the birth of the United States of America. But it almost wasn't. Really? What do you mean? Well, not too long ago, the 4th of July almost ceased to exist. And not just America, but the entire world depended upon Will Smith to save the 4th of July. Huh? What? Hmm. Maybe I'm not explaining it well enough. Hmm. I know who could help. Hey, V.C. Arnold! I am V.C. Arnold. I am standing by to answer your questions, regardless of how stupid and ridiculous they are. What can you tell us about the 4th of July that almost wasn't? On July 4th, 1996, planet Earth came under attack by invading aliens due to a counterattack. Utilizing the combined efforts of Will Smith, Jeff Goldblum, and Bill Pullman, the attack was thwarted and July 4th was saved. Huh. Hmm. Totally happened. Hmm. Really did. Intriguing. That day would be recorded in history and subsequently make alien invasion movies synonymous with the 4th of July. Hmm. I'm afraid I still don't fully understand. Was it Bill Pullman or Bill Paxton? Well, hmm. Hey, V.C. Arnold, could you give us an adventure that explains this very topic? All right, this ought to help, little creep. Oh, goody, this'll be fun. Okay, mates, let's go on an alien invasion adventure and take a look at the movie that did indeed make the concept synonymous with the 4th of July and the movie whose VHS slowly became the world's most commonly found thrift store find. Let's take a look. Attention crew of the VHS pirate ship, your vessel is now mine. Friend of yours? M -m me I, I thought you knew him. Silence. I am Baylock, commander of the Pisarius. Wow, it's an alien. Yes, I am what you would call an alien. I have captured your vessel. Escape is impossible. Wow, this is a pretty severe situation. Yeah, seems pretty Pisarius. <laughs> Silence! Your Earth wit will not save you. Escape is impossible, as I have said before. Uh, what do you want? Your presence is demanded upon my ship. If you do not comply, your vessel and your crew will be destroyed. Oh, oh man, I, I can't. I just got the grill all fired up and the, the coals are just right. And what about the potato salad? And Little Creep wants potato salad? Silence! You will comply or be destroyed. All right, all right. I'll make first contact with alien life and save the crew of my ship. Big deal. Are you happy? Yeah, what a total drama queen. Yeah. Prepare to beam aboard. Hmm, how do we prepare for that? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how not to.
<sighs> Finally. Ah. Oh. Ah. Huh. Whoa. Wow, this uh, must be the Pisarius. Sure. Looks, Looks like, like a spaceship to me. Hmm. Hey, look. It's, it's a picture of Baylock. And a camcorder? Huh. I guess they have a low budget too. <laughs> yeah. Man, this is weird stuff. You know, I think we've been had. Yeah, this is starting to seem like an episode of the Funky Phantom. <laughs> hmm. What an obscure reference. Hmm. I'm Baylock. Welcome aboard. Hello, friends. Welcome to my ship. Be comfortable. You're Baylock? I know, I know. A thousand questions. But first, some refreshments. I'm all out of Tranya, but how about some Diet Lemon Lime Soda? I hope you relish it as much as I. Uh, no thank you. You'll have to forgive us if we're kind of freaked out. Yeah, we, we thought you were a terrifying alien warlord. <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> Forgive my ruse. I used that to frighten you and get your attention. If it were me as I am, would you have listened? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, uh, you look like a toe. What? You just have no cooth at all, do you? What? I mean, come on. Uh, some people like toes. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Oh, Captain, you and your tiny skeleton friend are most amusing, and that is precisely why I invited you upon my ship. On my planet, your show is very popular, and I simply had to meet you. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> well, uh, it's always nice to meet a fan. You know, um, I have a lot of questions here. Ah, you mean like how this is supposed to be an episode about Independence Day, and yet we're doing a pretty obvious Star Trek reference? Yes, among others. Ah, ha, 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 ha. I would be honored if you were to watch your new adventure with me here on my ship. Well, I don't see why not. Do you, little creep? Can I have a potato salad? Sure. Well, mates... Looks like we're hanging out at Baylocks. Enjoy today's adventure. Happy July 4th and happy birthday, America. Yo ho ho. Time for the show. Yarr. Yarr. Aliens. Flying saucers, extraterrestrials, UFOs, Martians, little green men from Mars. Okay, that's enough. You get the point. Yes, aliens, human beings have always been fascinated with the concept of extraterrestrial life. Now, is that fascination well-founded? Well, that's not for me to judge. But I will say that we as human beings are obsessed with the notion of aliens. And in fact, we seem to take this notion a step further and prefer our alien experiences to be a bit more interactive with the concept of alien invasion. Yes, the incredible and outrageous circumstance of aliens invading Earth is quite the popular notion. Yep, an alien race taking over our planet and destroying humanity as we know it is a concept that has become quite cliche and has become a theme in many stories and movies. Yes, something that in reality would be a horrific and terrifying experience is naturally, of course, entertaining. And therefore, the world of entertainment would greet this theme with open arms. And this all started with the father of science fiction himself, H.G. Wells, and his famous book, War, War of, of the, the Worlds. Worlds. This book was ginormously popular and made the concept of alien invaders a mainstay of entertainment. So this story and this idea was tremendous. It was different. People loved it. They couldn't get enough of the idea of aliens coming to Earth and taking over for 
some reason. But this story would really cascade into the stratosphere of popularity with one certain famous radio broadcast. Yes, Orson Welles adapted this story to a radio drama and it originally broadcast October 30th, 1938. Now, as you may know, this isn't famous for the story itself but rather for the commotion it caused. Yes, it was all sorts of Halloween fun as the country listened to this broadcast and was terrified because they were convinced it was real and planet Earth was being invaded by aliens. It has been said that radio is theater for the mind, but this has taken it a little too far, don't you think? But once everybody settled down and realized they had been duped by a very well-performed and very convincing radio broadcast, well, everybody had quite a laugh in what would be one of the most important moments of radio history. Now, later on down the road, it was said that most of the panic was exaggerated by certain newspapers. Newspapers who were seeking to discredit radio as a media format. Yeah, we forget that back in that time, radio and newspapers were rivals, and each one was always trying to outdo one another in order to be your main media resource. So you got a radio broadcast that convinced everyone that there was a Martian invasion taking place, and then newspapers exaggerating and lying about the reaction. It just goes to show you how easily manipulated we can be by such things. <laughs> really makes you think, but that's none of my business. <clears throat> but anyway, though there was some panic invoked by this radio broadcast, it certainly wasn't on the scale that history would have us believe. But regardless, that is what this radio drama is famous for, and it certainly skyrocketed the popularity of War of the Worlds. And it was only a matter of time before this story made it to the big screen. Yes, the popularity of this story would not stop and would continue to grow throughout the decades, giving us several different film adaptations, the first and most famous being released in theaters August 13th, 1950. And this certainly is one of those movies that are considered important, whatever that means, and was chosen by the Library of Congress for being quote unquote historically significant due in part to the film's notions referring to the paranoia about the atomic age which was a pretty good thing to be paranoid about. Yes, let's not forget that during the 50s, there was the constant fear of atomic warfare. And the U.S. government tried to help out, comfort us, and ease our fears by telling us in case of an atomic attack, you'd be safe as long as you hid under your desk. Hmm, sure, that makes sense. I feel better already. And this film is also in the National Film Registry. It's just one of those movies that really stands out in history. And of course, it would go on to be released on VHS several times. And Paramount Home Video was all over this one, like a bum on a bologna sandwich. They first released it on VHS in 1986, then again in 1990, then again in 1991, for some reason. I don't know why they did that. I mean, <laughs> you just released it on VHS a year before, so why would you do it again? I, I, I don't get it. Oh, well, it's their money. And they even released this rare sleeve variant. You know, it cost a lot of money to produce and distribute VHS tapes. I mean, I know it's Paramount and all, but jeez, they had to be hemorrhaging money. And they would release it one final time in 1996. So, since this is VHS of an old sci-fi movie, certainly it must be worth a lot of money. It must be pretty expensive to get nowadays. Perhaps it follows the same formula as old horror movie VHS and commands a steep price. Or perhaps not. Yeah, apparently it doesn't work the same way because you can find any of these distributions for dirt cheap. Seven buckaroonies seems to be the average, even for the first distribution. And you can find some for as cheap as three buckaroonies. So what's going on here? I mean, hell, I found the 1990 distribution in a thrift store for a quarter, and I thought I got pretty lucky. Thought I had a pretty good find, but I mean, compared to the other prices that they're going for nowadays, I, I don't know, I don't feel as lucky. Well, the thing is, they made a shitload of these. All of these distributions were produced on a massive scale. I mean, clearly, Paramount was not too concerned about spending too much money on this. And let's be honest, 
why not? Why not spend a lot of money on this? I mean, War of the Worlds is a good movie. It's a popular movie. It's a movie and a story that would give us an all new subgenre of entertainment, an alien, alien invasion. invasion. And there are plenty of movies that demonstrated the alien invasion concept, including one that would breathe new life into the alien invasion thing and reign supreme throughout the mid 90s. And today, we're gonna take a look at some alien invasion movies and spotlight the movie that tells the story of how Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith saved the world from Martian invaders. Because it's today's adventure. Welcome to Earth, the Captain Adams VHS pirate ship Independence Day special. Yes, the good old alien invasion flick, and man, there sure were a lot of them throughout the 1950s. And one could equate the amount of them to the amount of beach party and surfer movies throughout the 1960s. Yeah, people were apeshit about beach party movies in the 60s, and just a decade prior, they were apey about Martian movies. It's kind of funny how they made that switch. Huh. So the 1950s certainly made the alien invasion movie a thing. And though this new subgenre was popular, popular, pop, popularized, pop, pop, popular, ah, it was made popular by War of the Worlds. It wasn't the first alien invasion movie of the 50s. No, there was The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was released in theaters September 18th, 1951. And though this is a sci-fi classic, I suppose it's not really an alien invasion movie. I guess it's more like an alien visitation movie. Mom, the aliens are here. And it does not involve aliens, but instead just one alien and his weird robot friend, who is named Gort, and the story revolves around Klaatu, a Martian who looks suspiciously human. Yep, an alien race who comes from the other side of the galaxy looks just like human beings. Yep, totally believable. Anyway, Klaatu, the <clears throat> Martian, comes to warn Earth about the dangers of atomic warfare. And that if we humans don't stop fucking around with atomic energy, he didn't really say that, but you know, that's what he meant, then his people will be forced to destroy Earth. Which pretty much means that humans now had a power they didn't completely understand, and therefore put the entire universe at risk. And Klaatu's people would neutralize the threat if need be. So it's kind of an alien invasion flick, more like the threats of an alien invasion flick, I guess, I'm, I'm not really sure. And Klaatu is really polite the whole time, so it's like a nice alien invasion flick kind of thing. It's more like a morality play about the dangers of atomic energy, which I had said earlier was a pretty damn big deal throughout the 50s. So whether you want to call it a morality play, you want to call it an alien invasion flick, or a nice alien invasion flick, or an alien visitation flick, Either way, this is an important movie. Because really, this was one of the first major times that Hollywood put an alien on the big screen. Even though that alien looked like a human. But, uh, you know, you take what you can get, okay? And it's also quote-unquote important because, as I had mentioned, it warns about the dangers of atomic energy. Much like War of the Worlds. Or rather, War of the Worlds is like this because this came out before War of the Worlds. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And much like War of the Worlds, this film was also deemed historically significant by the Library of Congress and placed in the National Film Registry. So if you just so happen to think that movies about alien invasion are not a big deal, just remember that there are two of them in the Library of Congress. Whoa. And of course, a movie that is so historically significant would find immortality on home video. It would first be released on VHS and beta by Magnetic Home Video in 1978. Kinda hard to believe, ain't it? Yeah, I know. I had the same reaction myself. Now, we tend to think of VHS and Betamax as objects from the 80s, and they are, but we gotta keep in mind that both of these got their start in 1976. Which makes the magnetic home video distribution not only the first home video distribution of the day the earth stood still, but one of the first home video distributions ever. So that's pretty neat. And even though magnetic home video was one of the purveyors in home video distribution, they would eventually be bought out by CBS Fox Home Video in 1982. And with that buyout came all the home video licenses. 
is that magnetic home video previously had, including the day the Earth stood still. And CBS Fox Home Video would re-release it in 1984, and again in 1991, only this time it came with some pretty hip cover art. Hey kids, you wanna be cool? You wanna be hip? Well, of course you do. Well, check out this new VHS. VHS! It's VHS of the day the Earth stood still. VHS of the day the Earth stood still. That's right, kids. Be cool. Ignore your parents. Stay out late. Drop out of school. Be hip. Buy this new VHS. VHS of the day the Earth stood still. Oh, yeah! All right, that, that might have been a bit excessive, okay? I'm sure that's not what they were going for. All right, let's not let's not be smart asses here, okay? And the 1984 distribution and the 1991 distribution are rather easy to find today and go for pretty cheap. And even the 1978 Magnetic Home Video distribution is rather easy to find and seems to go, on average, from anywhere between 15 to 25 bucks, which is rather cheap considering that this is one of the first VHSs to ever exist. I mean, you would just think that would make it be worth more, but it's... <laughs> It's, it, it doesn't work that way, I guess. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of confusing aspects about VHS collecting. There really is no market. It seems like the value depends on how much someone is selling it for and how much someone is willing to pay for it. And that sounds both very obvious and convoluted. So movies like War of the Worlds and The Day the Earth Stood Still are films that have very subtle and metaphoric titles. The Earth never stood still. If it did, we'd all go flying. Yes, there are movies where the title does not tell you what the movie is about and makes you say, gee, this movie could be about anything. So perhaps you like your alien invasion movie to have a more direct and precise title. One that tells you exactly what the movie is about. Well, how about Earth vs. The, the Flying Saucers? Saucers? Which was released in theaters June 13th, 1956. And this movie is exactly what it says it is. It's Earth vs. The Flying Saucers. Yeah, there's no pesky subtext or subliminal pretense or whatever you want to call it. This movie is called Earth versus the Flying Saucers and it's about Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Yep, it does not get more obvious than that and this is actually a pretty good movie. And this does have some pretty good visuals too, especially for the time. I mean, look at that. There's a flying saucer crashing into the Capitol building. I mean, are they trying to invade us or do us a favor? <laughs> Am I right? Am I right, folks? Am I right? You know what I mean. Yeah, this guy gets it. Yep, yep, yep. And this movie's fate on VHS would be spared not. What? It would be released on VHS by Good Times Home Video in 1989, and it would be released again in 1996 by Columbia TriStar Home Video, and as you can see, they didn't bother changing the cover art very much. Oh, we appreciate all your efforts. Yeah, they just removed the people and left the background as it was. I mean, come on, you could have done a little better than that. Your Columbia TriStar home video for fuck's sake. Or, I don't know, I'm just spitballing ideas here. I mean, you could have used the original poster. Yeah. What gives? So let's move on to an alien invasion movie that's rather subtle in its invading alien premise with Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which was released in theaters February 5th, 1956. And I say it's subtle because it's an alien invasion flick that does not involve attacking hordes of Martians or armadas of UFOs. Instead, it involves spores sent from outer space by aliens. Yeah, good thing they weren't sent through the post office or else we'd still be waiting on them. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right, folks? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, right? Right? And these spores would replicate the human race, replacing them with emotionless imposters. With the aliens' ultimate goal being to eventually dominate planet Earth, which does seem like a very effortless way to take over planet Earth. I mean, you wouldn't have to waste money on space fuel or anything like that. And this movie was a big hit. It would go on to be a cult favorite, a science fiction classic, and be a landmark in outrageous science fiction movie titles. And speaking of that, this is another movie with a very direct title. It's called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and I'll be damned if it's not about Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And this would go on to have a remake in 1978 and another remake of sorts in 1993. And remember earlier when I said that there were two alien invasion movies in the Library of Congress? Well, 
make that three because this one's in there too. Yes, this was also deemed historically significant and placed in the National Film Registry. And if you really care about that, well, that's up to you. Anyways, this would first be released on VHS by Nostalgia Merchant in 1981. Natalie Merchant? No, Nostalgia Merchant. And then Republic Pictures Home Video acquired the home video rights to this and would release their own distribution in 1986 in this nifty, neato torpedo clamshell as part of their Collector's Classic series. Collector's Classics. And Republic Pictures Home Video would stick with the home video rights for this movie like shit on Velcro as they would go on to release this in 1988 and again in 1995. And both of these more recent distributions are rather easy to find today and go for around seven bucks. The 1986 distribution is not as easy to find but not impossible and usually goes for an average of 20 bucks. And the Natalie Merchant, I mean, Nostalgia Merchant distribution, well, that's not quite easy to find either. It's not impossible to find it, but you're getting pretty close to impossible. But just because something's almost impossible to find today does not mean it will be tomorrow. Yeah, things seem to pop up out there on the high seas of the internet, so always keep checking. You never know. And what about the 1978 remake? MGM Home Video would grab hold of the home video distribution rights to this and release it in 1983 in their famed book box. Okay, and here's what's weird about this. This was released in 1983 by MGM Home Video, right? Right, but apparently that was only in the US because outside of the US, this was released a year earlier in 1982 by Warner Home Video. What is going on there? Well, I probably could find out rather easily with just a little research, but I'm not. And MGM Home Video would go on to release this again in 1988, again in 1992, and again in 1997 as part of their Contemporary Classics Collection. Contemporary Classics Collection. And they would release it one more time in the year 2000. And this distribution was part of their MGM Movie Time, Time collection. collection. And all of these distributions are relatively easy to find today and rather cheap, with the exception being the book box distribution, which I can't find this thing anywhere. But again, it could pop up somewhere tomorrow, so, you know, I don't know. This 1978 remake plays out more like a horror movie than the original did, and I believe that the cast in this movie does not get enough recognition. Sure, Donald Sutherland is in this, we all know that. He gets the most credit for his role in this film. But I think we all tend to forget that Jeff Goldblum and Leonard Nimoy are also in this. And it sure is neat to see them all in a movie together. So War of the Worlds, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers are just some examples of alien invasion movies. There are plenty more where that came from. And they expand past the 50s and into the modern era, especially in the mid 90s where the genre was reborn. And we'll talk all about it when we come back. Don't touch that dial, me hearties. Captain Adam's VHS Pirate Ship will be right back. Hey there, folks, it's me, Little Vino. And did you fuck your car up again? Maybe it's overheating because you never flushed your radiator. Did you even know you're supposed to do that? Or maybe your transmission's fucked up because you didn't know your car was a stick shift and you drove with it in first gear for 10 goddamn miles. Or maybe you need some body work done because you fucked up your rear end backing out of a parking spot by smashing into some other car because you couldn't see because of all the goddamn stickers on your rear window. Bunch of stickers that say Save the Whales and all these avant-garde speed metal bands that nobody's heard of. Well, it's too bad you don't put as much effort into driving as you do letting the world know how unique and different you are. Well, whatever your stupid ass problem is, your car's fucked up and I'm sure it's your fault. But I ain't here to judge. I'm just here to fix your car and serve you a nice cheesesteak while you wait. So come on down to Little Vino's Automotive Repair and Cheesesteak Emporium. We do all kinds of automotive repair and got lots of cheesesteaks. There's no job too small and no moron too stupid. We got the best cheesesteaks in the country in several locations to serve you better. So come on down, let me fix your fucked up car and eat a nice cheesesteak. Just because you're a fucking moron doesn't mean your taste buds are. Little Vino's Automotive Repair and Cheesesteak Emporium. 
Attention, attention, stop what you're doing right now. If you've done anything in life, you might have been exposed to metagotic orpheline, and you may be entitled to compensation. That's right, you, yes, you, you may have been exposed to metagotic orpheline. If you have to ask what it is, you've probably been exposed to it. You're sick as shit, and you may be entitled to compensation. If you've done anything in life, you may have been exposed to metagotic orpheline. You, yes, you, you watching this, you may have been exposed to metagotic orpheline, and you may be entitled to compensation. Call the law offices of Dylan and Triceratops today. You may have been exposed to metagotic orpheline, and you may be entitled to compensation. Call the law offices of Dylan and Triceratops today. That's 1-800-TRICERATOPS. That's 1-800-TRICERATOPS. You may have been exposed to metagotic orpheline, and Dylan and Triceratops is here to help. Call today. New from Buco Toys, it's Fork Stewards. Now you can control the battle as King Prong defends his kingdom against the evil Spoon Goon. Dinner time's over, your majesty. No chance, Spoon Goon. Then suddenly, Spoon Goon calls in his henchman, Spatula Kong. Ha ha ha. Your time is up, King Prong. Oh no, not Spatula Kong. Ah. No one can match his spatula. <laughs> King Prong regroups as Spoon Goon retreats to his castle. Sorry, your highness. This party's by invite only. <laughs> That's what you think, Spoon Goon. It's time I crash this party. Ah! We shall meet again, King Prong. You control the battle with Fork Stewards. Fork, Fork Stewards. Stewards. Fork Stewards. King Prong, Spoon Goon, and Spatula Kong each sold separately. Fork Stewards by Buco Toys. Fork, Fork Stewards. Yeah! Ah, it's summertime down at Cowboy Pork Chops Choke and Puke Family Restaurants. Come on down and try our new sizzling summertime menu. I'm grilling up all your summertime favorites, so come on down and get yourself a skinless hot dog, hot or cold, your choice. Only five bucks. Or get yourself a colossal cob of street corn. But this ain't no highfalutin street corn you get for them fancy pants food trucks your college kids like so much. No, this is corn that was in the street. Get it? <laughs> only five bucks. And as always, get our world famous fried fart basket. Still only five bucks. And get a free cat map toy with the purchase of any little buckaroo kids meal. So come on in and try our new sizzling summertime menu down here at Cowboy Pork Chops Choke and Puke Family Restaurant. That's right on the corner of Route 25 and get a whiff Boulevard right beside Bill's Dirty Mattress Alley. Yeehaw! Cowboy Pork Chops not responsible for death or illness. We now return to Captain Adam's VHS Pirate Ship. Uh, all right. Now we just gotta grab some hot dog buns and some beers and head on back to Baylocks. And don't forget the potato salad. Yes, potato salad. <laughs> hey, uh, wait a minute. Something's not quite right. Yeah, something seems a little off. Ah, ah! ah shit. Baylock must have beamed us back into an earlier episode. I wonder what episode it could be. Hmm, well, well, I'll, I'll ask. Hey, uh, excuse me, uh, me? What episode is this? Hmm, uh, it's, uh, Finding Frankenstein movies. It's Finding Frankenstein movies. Oh, you know, in my opinion, one of your more finer works. Very good stuff. Oh, <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who are you? I am you, but from the future. Uh, yeah, sure. How do you know that I'm not further from the future and you're actually from the past? He's, He's got, got you, you there. there. No, he doesn't. Well, well see, this, this could work in a number of different ways. ways. You, you could, could be from the past, sent here to do this episode, or you could be farther from the future, sent back to the past to do that episode, or, uh, this episode, and you are actually from the future. So you, it could work that way, yeah. Yeah, I guess. But wait a minute. Uh, if me going back to the past happens to me in the future, which therefore also happens to you in the future, that means that me going back to the past is part of my future. Whoa. Whoa. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, anyways, this is the present now, and they call it the present because today is a gift. Oh, yep. that's nice. That's, nice. That's, 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 that's pretty deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, how did you get here? Uh, well, we were hanging out with this little alien, and uh, he beamed us back to get hot dog buns, 
But uh, I guess he must have beamed us back too far because now we're here. Yeah, he must have screwed up and beamed us back into the wrong timeline because now we're here in the past. Which would be the future. Whoa. Mm-hmm. So, uh... Hot dog buns? Uh, yeah, well, wh where we're from is the 4th of July, and uh, we're doing an uh, Independence Day special. Mm. Ah, so uh, I do a special about Independence Day? Well, I mean, uh, we talk about uh, alien invasion movies, and there's this guy from Star Trek. It's, it's, it's a pretty good time. Hmm. Well, um, do I have more subscribers in the future? Oh, <clears throat> well, uh, oh. <clears throat> Uh, well, mates, uh, looks like we should get back to the adventure. <clears throat> so, uh, without further ado, yo ho ho, yep. back to the show. Yar. Yar. Mm -hmm. So, the 1950s and alien invasion movies would go together like proverbial peanut butter and jelly. This is due in large part to the 50s being a hotbed of geopolitical activity. And most of these movies would have underlying messages. War of the Worlds and The Day the Earth Stood Still would warn about atomic warfare. And the invasion of the Body Snatchers was said to be a Cold War hit piece warning about commie invaders. And the same would be said about other alien invasion movies. But it it might have been just filmmakers riding the wave of a commercially proven genre. And we, as human beings, have a tendency to overthink things, very silly things, like Invasion of the Saucer Men, which was released in theaters June 19th, 1957, and it looks like we're sticking with the movies with direct titles thing because this is pretty direct. As the name implies, this movie is about an invasion of saucer men, space saucer men. Alien Space Saucer Men. Alien Space Saucer Men with big old Brussels sprout heads. And these produce craniumed fellows would go on to be the archetypal image of Martian invaders through many different aspects of popular culture. And for the time, they were pretty terrifying. In fact, they still are pretty terrifying. In fact, even more, they look better than most CGI nowadays. This film is pretty silly, and the jury is still out on whether or not this was intended to be a parody of itself. Regardless, this is still a memorable film, and what's neat is that this stars Frank Gorshin. Yes, the man who would be best known for portraying the Riddler in the Batman television series. And really, is there anyone else who could have played a better Riddler? No. And if you say Jim Carrey, we're not friends anymore. We're not friends anymore. Frank Gorshin was made for that role. And when you think of the Riddler, you think of him. It's kind of like Terry Camilleri's performance as Napoleon in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I mean, I can't think of Napoleon without thinking of that guy. Yes, he was the perfect Napoleon, and Gorshin was the perfect Riddler. Now, there were a few Batman episodes where Gorshin wasn't available, and John Astin substituted for him. And he, of course, is best known for his portrayal of Gomez Adams on the Adams Family television show. And he didn't do a bad job as the Riddler. It's just that, well, he didn't shave his mustache. So it seemed like it was Gomez Adams pretending to be the Riddler. I don't know. Now, for some reason, mustaches and villains from the Batman television show would be a thing because Cesar Romero, the man who portrayed the Joker, refused to shave his mustache. So they just put makeup over it. And if you look real close, you can see it. But his performance was so good that no one gave a shit. Now, what the hell was I talking about? Ah, Frank Gorshin. He was also known for his role on that one episode of Star Trek about racial tolerance where he portrayed an alien. Yes, folks, that's an alien. And in Invasion of the Saucer Men, he portrays a drunk that eventually dies of alcohol poisoning. So, uh, eesh, that happens. And what's weird is that the aliens actually caused this to happen. So, I mean... You just have to watch the movie for this to make sense. And I'm not even sure that'll help. And back to the title of this movie. In the UK, it was released as Invasion of the Hell Creatures. Which isn't very direct, is it? I mean, Hell Creatures implies that they're from hell. They're not from hell, they're from outer space. I mean, maybe a metaphoric hell because they're mean? I don't know. But this does sound like a white zombie album. Uh, Anyway, Invasion of the Saucer Men would eventually be released on VHS by Columbia TriStar Home Video in 1993. And that's it. This is a one distribution kind of deal. And its value today? 
Well, like I said earlier, there really is no market scale. It fluctuates and everyone just sort of guesses. Though this does have the widest price range of any VHS I've ever seen for sale. It ranges from $9, $13, $25, $30, $40, $50, and even one up for sale for $100. I don't believe they're going to get that price, especially when the listing right above it is going for $13 for the exact same thing. Oh, and uh, by the way, I'm not telling anyone how to do their business, but when you're selling a tape for $100, you might want to at least throw in free shipping. Come on, dude, it's three bucks. So being that this only had one VHS release, is it rare? Well, that doesn't really mean anything. But sellers certainly love to throw the word rare around. I mean, it's not exactly rare when there's 27 other listings. So, in keeping with our theme of movies with direct titles, we have Invaders from Mars! Which is about invaders from Jupiter. <laughs> no, no, they're from Mars. And this was released in theaters April 22nd, 1953. And if you've been paying attention, you'll note that this was released five months before War of the Worlds. And this was totally done on purpose. It would be rushed into theaters before War of the Worlds so it could be the first colorized version of an alien invasion on film. Well, it worked, and it was, and no one gives a shit. Yeah, history seems to only remember War of the Worlds, which is a shame because this movie isn't bad. It has, um interesting alien imagery. Hi, kids. But eventually, this would all just end up being scoffed at. Now, certainly this film is memorable, and this would go on to inspire Toby Hooper to do a remake, which was released in June of 1986. Yes, the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist would do his own rendition of this, and though it didn't draw flies at the box office, it would go on to have a cult following. And this would be released on VHS in 1986 by a collaboration between Media Home Entertainment and Canon Video. And then it would be released in 1989 by Video Treasures, and then it was released in 1996 by Anchor Bay as a special collector's edition. Now here's what's weird. The earlier distributions are actually easier to find than the 1996 distribution, and it doesn't normally work that way. But you can score yourself the 86 or 89 distributions for around 10 bucks a pop. How about the original? How about the original? That was released on VHS in 1986, by a collaboration between Fox Hills Video and Nostalgia Merchant. Natalie Merchant. Come on, we've already done that bit. Oh. It would also be released in 1996 by Good Times Home Video and then in 1997 by, uh... Science Fiction Gold? Yes, I'm afraid that this movie's fates on VHS would end with being a dollar store videotape. Yeah, you know, those cheap non-licensed cartoon cavalcade VHS that you would find at McCrory's or the Family Dollar. Well, uh, this is kind of the same thing. Oh yeah, I'm sure that tape isn't going to pretty much disintegrate after one viewing. But let's move on to Target Earth. Released in theaters November 7th, 1954, this early sci-fi gem is an alien invasion movie that put its own spin on the concept by featuring alien robots as the invaders. Yes, robotic synthetic usurpers as opposed to flesh and blood Martian antagonists, which I'm fine with that idea, but the way they made them look does make it a little hard to take them seriously. I mean, look at that. Hi, kids. But as goofy as this invading robot menace may look, it still looks real. It looks real because it is real. And that is because it's really there, which is why practical effects will always be superior to CGI. This goofy ass looking robot was actually on set and the actors did not have to pretend it was there. You get a real reaction because the thing they're reacting to is an actual entity and not just something that was put together in post-production. But I digress. Anyway, Target Earth would fade away from the memory of time, but it would eventually be released on VHS in 1996 by VCI Home Video. Who is VCI Home Video? I, 
I don't know, but they would release it again in 2003 as a special widescreen edition. So this movie would start off its life as a potential sci-fi classic, slowly be forgotten about, and then be put on VHS as a bothersome afterthought way into the 1990s. Kind of depressing considering that this was somebody's vision, this was somebody's dream, and I guess it just didn't connect. But I think it's still worth a watch, and if you want to find these for your VHS collection today, either of these distributions are easy to find and go for around five bucks. And then we have some alien invasion movies that really aren't alien invasion movies because they only involve one alien. And for one reason or another, these movies are always lumped into the other alien invasion movies that we've talked about so far today and I don't know it just seems like you can't have an invasion with just one person or alien you know what they say two is a crowd but one is not an invasion people say that no but they totally should and the number of marauders is the distinguishing factor between an invasion movie and a monster movie or at least it should work that way so much like the day the earth stood still these are some alien invasion movies that only feature a solo alien movies such as the thing from another world which was released in theaters april 6 1951 and is not to be confused with the thing from a different world a science fiction crossover featuring the 1987 Cosby Show spinoff and doesn't actually exist. Anyways, The Thing from Another World is a little story about an alien who crash lands in the Arctic, gets frozen in ice, discovered, then accidentally thawed out, then wreaks havoc like anyone would in such a situation. And this movie's title would eventually and unofficially be shortened to The Thing, and yes, it was the inspiration for the 1982 John Carpenter film. And what's neat is that this stars James Arness as The Thing from Another World. Yes, the man who would become most famous for portraying Marshall Matt Dillon on the television show Gunsmoke was once a monster. Which is interesting because that means that somebody saw this movie and said, hey, he would make a great cowboy, get him on the phone. This would be released on VHS in 1985 by Nostalgia Merchant, and then in 1993, Turner Home Entertainment released it twice. There was the regular version and then the colorized version. And it would be released one more time down the line as a 50th anniversary remastered edition. And though the 1985 Nostalgia Merchant distribution is a little hard to track down nowadays, you can find any of the other distributions with no trouble at all. And then we have It Came From Outer Space, which was released in theaters May 25th, 1953, and this would be Universal Pictures' first foray into 3D film. And this, of course, is about a lone alien that comes to Earth to wreak havoc. Yes, havoc was wrought, and a good time was had by all, and this is a very terrifying looking alien. Yes, yeah, say what you want to about these old movies, they sure knew how to make a monster scary. And this would be released on VHS numerous times, the most notable being the 1980 MCA Home Video release, as it is among the first VHS to ever exist, and this is very hard to track down nowadays, so good luck. So as it's been well established on today's adventure, the 50s were jam-packed with alien invasion movies. And though the ebb and flow would continue throughout the decades, the genre would have a resurgence in the mid 90s. And that is what brings us here today, that mega blockbuster hit, that mindless, meaningless movie you love to hate and hate to love, Independence Day, which was released in theaters July 3rd, 1996, and this movie was a huge deal. This movie was everywhere. They pushed the shit out of this, and just like the summer of 93 was all about dinosaurs due to Jurassic Park, the summer of 96 was all about aliens due to this movie. And if you recall, many of the movies that I talked about today had VHSs that were re-released in 1996, and this was in no doubt a way to capitalize on the new found popularity of alien invasion movies because they would have taglines like the original invasion or the original ufo classic which pretty much says hey kids do you like independence day well you'll love this and even a forgotten and obscure movie like target earth would have a vhs release in 96 yet yeah, target earth was not released on vhs prior to that year distributors were just digging up old alien movies and just throwing them on store shelves hey i would have done the same thing it's very clever marketing. It's interesting that Independence Day would have such a ripple effect, and this movie would become one of the epitomes of the summer blockbuster. It was made on a budget of $75 million and took in $817 million at the box office. This movie was enormous, and when it came time to release this bad boy on VHS, 
20th Century Fox Home Video was all over it. They made millions of these, legions of these, throngs, if you will. So many, in fact, that this alien invasion movie on VHS would become its own invasion of sorts. Ironic, these tapes were everywhere, and I think it's safe to say that every household had one, and maybe some still do. But chances are, they would end up on the internet on sale for a dollar or on thrift store shelves. Because really, what else are you supposed to do with them? They made so many of them that they eventually just end up circulating the planet till the end of time. And 20th Century Fox Home Video would come up with a clever way to suck more money out of you. They would release this twice in 96. There was the normal version, and then the widescreen version. Which, which came in a collector's clamshell to make you feel better about wasting more money. Because you were. You don't need a widescreen version of this movie. There's not much else to it. Now, whether you love this movie, you like this movie, are okay with this movie, could give a shit less about this movie, or hate this movie, you remember it. And even if you're one of the very few that hasn't seen this movie, you still know what it's all about. It's infectious. It gets into you. Like, uh... Like, uh, air herpes. Is that a real thing? No, no, no. no. It's, it's not a real thing. I was just uh, coming up with a metaphor. It, it's, it's not real. Because the story is simple, the premise is accessible, and the concept is easy to understand. Yes, it's a charming tale about a massive alien invasion that destroys every major city on the planet. Oh, it's the Cinderella story we all love to hear. But retribution comes swiftly as a counterattack is launched by Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith. The humans beat the aliens and bring them down. And given the fact that this movie takes place during well, Independence Day. It made alien invasion movies synonymous with the 4th of July. And like it or not, love it or hate it, it's still a fun movie to watch over the holiday. I mean, what else are you supposed to watch? Born on the 4th of July? Oh, hey man, why don't you come over for the 4th? We're gonna grill up some burgers and some dogs and watch Born on the 4th of July and get really depressed. Yeah, great idea, no thanks. So 96, big year for aliens, big year for alien movies, not just Independence Day, but also Mars Attacks, which was released in theaters December 13th of that year, and this this is an alien invasion movie that's more of a comedy. Well, it is a comedy, and it's not just a parody of the genre, but also a parody of itself. This is a movie that does not take itself too seriously, but the casting director sure as hell did, as this movie boasts an impressive roster of actors. An enormous cast for a turd in the punch bowl. Yes, this movie was made to be insulted, and would lead many people to believe that this was the biggest piece of shit Tim Burton ever made. Of course, this was long before the release of his version of Alice in Wonderland. I'm not going to talk too much more about Mars Attacks because, uh, well, uh, well, I don't want to. So, in closing, human beings will forever be fascinated with alien life. And we will always wonder that when we look up into the stars, if there is someone or something looking back. We shall always be obsessed with whether or not extraterrestrial life exists. And if it does exist, we should hope that they never invade, because based on the movies that I've talked about today, it would be really easy. So until next time, me hearties, keep watching the skies and have a happy and safe July 4th. I gotta get going. I'm gonna go see some fireworks. My hand! Ladies and gentlemen, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's adventure. Be sure to hit subscribe and share this shit and take care out there and I'll see you next time only on Captain Adam's VHS Pirate Ship. Captain Adams VHS Pirate Shop on eBay today.